is a journey into sound. Being spoke on, you know, in a category as the best MCs, you know, ever in the game, you want to live up to that. And you want to show that, you know, I can make trends, I can take it to the next level. I guess the accolades I've been given has been the fuel of my fight. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume. Pump that bass. Growing up in New York, to me, was, was pivotal. You know, I learned a lot. You know, if it was Brooklyn, the Bronx, even Jersey, you see how people, how their culture is different in different places. You know what I mean? They way of life. Coming from Long Island, I always felt like I was on the outside looking in whenever I went to the city. It's not like he'd lived a bunch of other places and then decided that New York was it and he was going to write about New York. It was just the air he'd been breathing, you know, the food he'd been eating, the friends he'd made. In retrospect, we can look back and say, oh yes, Rakim is an archetypal New York rapper and, you know, what he writes about is redolent of New York City in the same way that what Snoop writes about speaks about L.A. I moved in 1987. And New York was raw, period. Like, really, really raw. Rawer than it is now. I don't know that Rakim repped New York as much as he repped himself. He is a unique, poetic voice with a unique vision and a unique vocabulary, a unique set of subjects that he wants to address. And I don't know that it speaks to New York per se. It speaks to his vision, and not just his vision this way, but kind of his inner vision. When I was young, the music influenced me in such a big way, man. I mean, like I said, I played the saxophone, learned how to read music. It's funny, because I was so young listening to jazz artists and admiring John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk. And that really gave me a, a deeper understanding of it, you know what I mean? My aunt was a blues singer herself, Ruth Brown. I would go over to her house and, you know, be amazed that she was just so down to earth. That kind of let me know that the realer and the more down to earth you was, the easier it would be to do your thing. That's when you had enough of and it'll make you choke, you can't provoke, you can't cope, you should have broke because I ain't no joke. It was funny, um, this guy I played football with, um, PAL football, named Alvin Tony, met Eric B and brought Eric B to my house and um, introduced me to him. He told me he knew uh, Magic and Marley Mall. It was funny at that point, I thought I was going to be a football player, but uh, he introduced me to, you know, Eric B and Eric B was trying to make a record. So, you know, we sat down and came up with um, Eric B as president and the melody. Had no idea it was gonna, you know, blow up like it did and, you know, take effect like it did. I was impressed by Rakim before I met him, the way that anybody was who was paying attention at that time. You know, when he and Eric came out in the summer of 1986 with Eric B is president and my melody, Oh my God, game changer, giant, giant record. Eric B is president, I was in college and to hear the way the, the, the beat was constructed and then the way he, he had a just like no one's ever had a rhyme flow like that. It's all about your rhyme style and, and we've never heard a pattern like that. He completely changed the way everybody rapped. Before him, people rhymed very simply, like one syllable, you know, the last word of every line would rhyme. Very much in the style of Run DMC. And he came and brought the idea of the multi-syllable flow. And, you know, that really set the tone for everything that would come after it. His patterns were crazy. And then his selection of tracks matched the way he sounded. There's almost no way to overstate the importance of that record. It retired the drum machine. That had to go away now because, you know, Eric and Marley Marl sort of as co-producers of that record. You know, all of a sudden they're bringing in sampling and James Brown as the rhythmic basis for this music. Rappers was just starting to do, you know, concerts and basketball arenas. So it, it was like, you know, really taking effect at that time. And for me to um, be able to get my foot in the door at that time, it was, um, you know, definitely, uh, uh, you could say, a dream come true. Cool, cool, Cause I don't get cool. upset. I kick a hole in the speaker, pull a plug, then I jet. What happens is, by 87 or so, Eric and Ra are looking to tour nationally, and Rush and Def Jam were putting on the national tours at that time. And so they ended up in our 
crew. I like when you look and sound like the record. Before we even knew what Rakim looked like, we didn't know what Eric B looked like. When we saw them, we were like, they look just like the record. The jewelry, the jackets, the, the mean face, the big fat sideburns that, 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 that we call pork chop sideburns that Rakim had. He looked like what we were hoping he was going to look like. My thoughts to God. 48 tracks to slide. He's just cool. He is the ultimate male archetype. He is stoic and thoughtful. How could you not look up to Rakim? Like, he was mysterious and tough, but not a tough guy necessarily, but also insanely smart and really articulate and really thoughtful about his art. I think that the records that Eric and Rakim made early in their career were just wonderful records, and those records have continued to influence other artists. There are now whatever, in musical terms, two generations, three generations of rappers who have come after Eric and Rakim. They listen to those records and they're inspired all over again because they remain unique. In, in some ways, nobody's topped them. The tales from the dark side by any means necessary. This is what has to be done. Make way, cause here I come. Certain songs kind of make me feel like I'm completing, you know, my legacy, even though it may not be a big radio song. But I think one of them is the 18th letter, the mystery. Another one is on the last album I just did, Holy Are You. I picked those records right there because that kind of explains what I'm trying to do the most. For me, Lyrics of Fury from his third album, it remains some of the best rapping ever committed to two and trio. You know, it's everything that you like about Rakim in one record. And of course, Juice, Know the Ledge from uh, the Juice soundtrack. I mean, the way that he rocks over that Bomb Squad beat is just absolutely amazing. And from the moment that bass line hits, everybody knows every word. Sip the juice, I got enough to go around. And the thought takes place uptown. I grew up on a sidewalk while on street talk and then talk the whole New York. It was just Still, just the overall package of when you see and hear Rakim, that overall package cannot ever be denied by anybody that loves rhyming or loves hip hop to begin with. I don't care if you were just born like my son a year, you know, a year ago, he's got to like Rakim. Like there's nothing you can say bad about him, nothing. Anybody that has something bad to say about Rakim does not know rhyming skills and they should even like put away and never touch one, not even just to say hello everybody, welcome to the show. I think when they did the top 50 MCs and I was um, named number one, that right there kind of woke me up, smacked me in the face, put a tear in my eye, like everything at, at, at one time because mid 90s towards the latter 90s, rap started changing, you know, going somewhat pop and I choose not to. So every now and then I would second guess myself, like, yo, am I doing the right thing? Should I be, you know, going pop? Should I be trying to sell more records? But when that happened, it, it let me know that I was doing something right. Couldn't really put my finger on what, but it, it, it kind of made it all worthwhile. He always maintained the integrity of his brand. He never tried to step out to chase any sort of commercial success or to chase any sort of relevancy. And I think when you do that, your sort of legend doesn't lose any luster. Some of the words I would use to describe myself, cautious. Another one I would say ambitious. And the third one I would say classic. And it's only because my listeners kind of told me that's what it is. So, you know, like I said, when you get accolades, you try to you know, live up to that. So if there's anything that an a artist could want more, it's to be classic. So yeah, I'm gonna give my name that title. Rock him a law classic, baby. I rock him, the fiend of a microphone. I'm not him. So leave my mic alone. Soon as the beat is felt, I'm ready to go. So fasten your seatbelt.